Our guest on This is America is Lieutenant Daniel Green, U.S. Navy Reserves. He's author of The Valley's Edge and fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Lieutenant, thank you so much for joining us on the program, and congratulations on your book, The Valley's Edge. You've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, haven't you? I have. Uh, altogether, 16 months uh, at the present, but I'm going back soon, so we'll add another eight months to that uh, tally. Uh, you've been there both uh, in the military and in, as a civilian as well? Yes, uh, both, both uh, uniforms, if you will, but mostly as a civilian. Uh, thank you for your service to the country. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Afghanistan. First of all, who, who are or who is the Taliban? Sure, yeah. <laughs> However, the, the sure. right way to say that is? Sure. Uh, the Taliban are predominantly Pashtun in ethnic or origin. Uh, depending on what source you go to, uh, plurality or a, a small majority of Afghanistan are Pashtuns. Uh, and then the Pashtun population, as you know, straddles the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and so the Taliban uh, are Pashtun over overwhelmingly. Uh, however, the movement also has allied itself with different sort of foreign fighters, for example, Chechens and uh, uh, fighters from the Arab uh, Middle East and other sort of countries. But predominantly, it's a Pashtun sort of movement, if you will. Uh, when we uh, read in the newspapers or watching something on television and they mention the Taliban, what, what's their, what's their uh, relationship with Afghanistan? What's their... Uh, history as far as they, they briefly controlled the country for about five or six years, mm -hmm. didn't they, in the late 90s going up to 2001? Right. Well, one of the sort of narratives that Taliban put forth is that they are a movement that sort of organically grew out of the madrasas, which are the religious schools that are throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan, but certainly along the border in Pakistan. They originally had sort of been uh, built during the 80s during the, the refugee issues, refugee problems. They sort of present themselves as this organic student-led movement of students, as Talib means student, and that they sort of came out of um, the Pashtun society, if you will, and then sought to sort of um, <clears throat> bring back justice as they saw it, so to remove sort of the rampant warlord government that sort of dominated Afghanistan after the Soviets withdrew and then the communist government fell. That's sort of their the general story of their origins, and then, as you know, they ran the country, at least the majority of the country, for a long period of time. Uh, and then, of course, we invaded in 2001, and that, that changed everything. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what was the relationship uh, then and uh, even now, I suppose, uh, with the Taliban and al-Qaeda? Sure. Uh, I think one of the things not, not many people know about is that one of the reasons the Taliban came into power was with the support of the Pakistani government, principally through their intelligence services. And this is a small thing such as just financial assistance to sort of basic things such as pro providing trucks and also, of course, weapons. Um, you know, when al-Qaeda or when the Taliban finally sort of consolidated their control over Afghanistan, it, cr it provided sort of a, a large training ground and a safe haven for a lot of different Islamic movements around the world, including al-Qaeda, to find sort of safe haven, a place they wouldn't be persecuted, in fact, would be supported by uh, the host government, the Taliban government. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how this originally uh, took, came about. You know, Osama bin Laden was pushed out of Sudan and eventually settled into um, southern Afghanistan and was a great, you know, supporter of the Taliban in many ways. So uh, he supported the Taliban, and the Taliban supported him. Huh? Absolutely. So it was a kind of a two-way street. Absolutely. So 9-11 uh, happens, and then how does the picture change? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that Osama bin Laden was doing to support the Taliban was he wanted to sort of demonstrate his gratitude to Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban, by providing uh, sort of killing Ahmed Shah Massoud, the leader of the Northern Alliance. That was the small element of, of Afghans in the northern part of the country that were still resisting the Taliban and al-Qaeda. And, al -Qaeda. and You may recall a couple of days before 9-11, he was assassinated by an al-Qaeda bomber. Um, and so, in addition to that, al-Qaeda also brought in foreign fighters to supplement the ranks of the Taliban. They provide a lot of additional skills, such as sniping and bomb making, things of this nature. So that was sort of the relationship there and how it evolved over time. Um, now, while they were co-located and were supportive of each other, they definitely had different goals, but their immediate sort of short-term um, compact worked well for both of them. So uh, after 9-11 and when we uh, retaliated uh, appropriately, 
uh, that uh, caused the Taliban to uh, scatter and, 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 and lay low for a while, huh? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the reasons Osama bin Laden was able to escape is through his relationship with many of the uh, Taliban and, and other Mujahideen factions, that some of which we had supported in the past, mm -hmm. principally the uh, Haqqani network mm -hmm. in eastern Afghanistan. They lay, played a leading role in facilitating Osama bin Laden's travels, as well as those of the other, other leadership of al-Qaeda. So uh, uh, turning the clock forward, and here we are now in uh, 2012, as they say, um, how many Taliban are there uh, in, in Afghanistan right now that we're fighting against? It's very hard, as you can imagine, to you know, put a number on that. Um, you, I would say you're sort of looking at it a couple of ways. One is you have members of the Pashtun community that sometimes align themselves with the Taliban, if only for a salary, uh, a grievance uh, uh, they may have against the government. These are sort of very uh, sort of dollar-a-day Taliban, as some people call them. Huh. And then the more, the more hardened core, hardcore, uh, as you can imagine, is, is much more devoted to the cause and the fight. Uh, it's difficult to say. It's, I, I would pretty much would wa probably want to say several thousands. Um, I don't want to put exact number but on that. But several. But it's not a huge amount of people, huh? Well, it's uh, sort of less than 100,000, more than probably 5,000. That's probably as much as I'd want to huh. give numbers. And, and, and what's, what's the goal of the Taliban right now? The short-term immediate goal is to raise the cost of the U.S. presence there t to such a point that the U.S. people no longer support our, our, our troops there and our spending of our money there and other things. So that right now is their short-term goal, sort of to make us tired and sort of pull back. The second goal, I would say, was to slowly eat, out, eat at the edges of the uh, Afghan government's influence. And do they want to take control of the government or get control or be in control of the I, government once I, again? Absolutely. I think that's certainly what they want. Their, their perspective is much longer term than ours. I sure. want to take a break in just a second here, but I want to get this on the table uh, before we go. Uh, it's, the, it's the ideology that is so... Um, uh, rigid, I guess. Is that the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm reading it, and learning about? It is rigid, but apparently the Taliban have some flexibility. They've tried to present themselves as sort of a new, a new Taliban, a new movement, sort of shorn of its sort of harsher practices uh, and its sort of um, abuses of the population and more sensitive to the needs of the people. Their own hearts and minds campaign, if you will. So, so do the people in uh, the day-to-day, the -day, not the dollar-a-day people, but sure. All the people in Afghanistan, how do they view the Taliban? Uh, if you're not a Pashtun, you're a Tajik, Uzbek, Turkmen, Hazara, some of the minority groups in, within Afghanistan, you very much are opposed to the Taliban coming back in any form, regardless of how much they may have changed or not. In the Pashtun community, there is such a thirst for stability, uh, just, just a, a willingness uh, to just have a, a safe life that you can just make your money, educate your children, have a better future that people are kind of willing to get that wherever they can. Unfortunately, the last 10 years have been very difficult for providing that kind of stability sure. for a number of reasons. Sure. And the Taliban do provide some basic social services like justice to adjudicate disputes between tribes or villages, things of that nature. Um, I think we've done a lot to sort of blunt that in the last few years, but there's a lot more we have to do. Let me uh, take a little break. We're talking with uh, Lieutenant uh, Daniel Green, U.S. Uh, Navy Reserves. Uh, he's the author of The Valley's Edge, uh, a year with the Pashtuns in the heartland of the Taliban. And I'm wondering if you can come in uh, very close on the, the cover of this book uh, so you can get a sense of the, uh, it, it's a stunning picture, and the topography of the country is absolutely amazing. I want to talk about that a little bit on the other side. So we'll take a little break uh, with uh, Lieutenant Daniel Green. Back on the other side, this is America. This is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. The Singapore Tourism Board, there's something for everyone. Singapore Airlines, a great way to fly. Poonsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard.
the CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust. So you've, uh, you've been in Iraq, you've been in Afghanistan. We want to talk about uh, uh, Afghanistan as a country, as a people, and learn a little bit more of that, because you were there uh, as a civilian and also as a soldier. Uh, the country itself, when I, when I say Afghanistan, mm -hmm. what triggers in your mind? What, 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 what can you share with us that we just don't sure. know? I would say the terrain is as formidable and as um, difficult sometimes as the people. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, interesting. You know, <laughs> the people uh, in the rural areas, which is predominantly where we're fighting. Uh, I mean, the Taliban in many different places, but a lot of the, a lot of them, of course, are in the rural areas. The people live uh, as much as uh, in tension and, and in sort of peace with the land as much as possible. It's a very elemental existence. Mm -hmm. They have to, if they don't save enough food, they starve in the winter. There are valleys that are shut off from outside contact for months on end because of snowfall. When rivers flood. There's not much to mitigate them. You know, villages can be washed away at different places. It's a very um, primal existence in many ways. And it's it's uh, agrarian. Uh, Absolutely, overwhelmingly. Oh, overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. And the um, so this uh, so the people. So what's the population of Af Afghanistan? Just well, a lot of, ballpark. Sure. Uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but it's actually physically uh, and numerically larger than Iraq. It has more people and is physically larger than the country of Iraq. Uh, however, most of the Taliban are focused in sort of the 60 or 50 percent of the population that's Pashtun. Uh, it's around 23 million or so. I, I think it's around ballpark. Okay. And, and, and the bordering countries are? Sure. Uh, to its east is uh, Pakistan, which wraps around its southern border because uh, Afghanistan is landlocked. And to its west is Iran. And then to the north is a number of Central Asian uh, countries, such as Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. Turkmenistan, um, uh, can't remember some of the other ones. Enough, that's, that's enough. That's a few stands. right there. I that's enough. Normally, I know these, but uh, several. Uh, the culture. Uh, I read everything from warm and hospitable mm -hmm. to uh, you mentioned the word justice a little while ago. Sure. Revenge sure. also. Sure. Uh, how do you see the culture? What should we know? What what piece mm -hmm. of information should we have? Sure. I, I think the story of Afghanistan is a story of a numbers of different outside powers washing over the country, whether it was Alexander the Great, the Soviets, the British, or, or us. In many ways, that's caused the Afghans, regardless of their ethnic background, to be very pragmatic people, mm. to always have uh, a plan to sort of exit the country or to survive within the country. Whoa. And because of that, there's such a mix of cultures. I mean, every outside power that come, comes in leaves a legacy. Uh, for, in a variety of ways. And I think that's created in the Afghan, the Afghan population uh, an interesting sort of openness to ideas that you don't often think about when you think of Afghanistan. I found the Afghans, in my interactions with them, you know, I was a very rural area that wasn't very well educated, uh, 80, 90 percent illiteracy. They were very open to me, even though I was, you know, not of their culture. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I don't want to overplay that. They, they, and there are elements of the country that rather have everyone go, not just the, you know, the U.S. Um, but I, I found that to be an aspect of their culture that was very appealing. Mm. Um, when you, uh, the, the first uh, tour that you were there, you were part of what they call a PRT, uh, uh, is a Provincial Reconstruction Team. Right, exactly. And this is under the U.S. State Department, right? Well, uh, it's a civil military team, which has a military component and a civilian component. I um, see, yep. Mm -hmm. Numerically speaking, most of the team is military, but it's... That's the security piece? Uh, security, but they also have civil affairs teams. Oh, okay. uh, the U.S. Army has them, the Marine Corps, and the Navy has some elements of that. And that the core of the team is the civil affairs element that's then supplemented through a, a Department of State political officer or advisor, a development, civilian development advisor, sometimes an agricultural advisor. Mm -hmm. And then the, the rest of the team is, you know, security or force protection, as we call it. So you're sent to, uh, how do you pronounce the name of the province you sure. were in? Uh, Aruzgan. Aruzgan. Perfect. Aruzgan. Yeah. Well, you said it, and I just I, know, I just echoed back. <laughs> Aruzgan. Uh, so what's what's day-to-day -day life in the, in the area for the Afghans themselves and then also uh, the team? Sure. Uh, overwhelmingly, Aruzgan is a very rural and agrarian uh, economy. And what the heck are you doing there? Why uh, are you there? Sure. Uh, Aruzgan, though it's small, it has a, sort of played a prominent role in history. In 2001, when Hamid Karzai motorcycled across the border from Pakistan, he went to Aruzgan to rally 
a network of colleagues and friends, some of whom had uh, worked with him during the Mujahideen years in the 1980s, and others to sort of lead this southern Pashtun uprising. It was right there in Aruzgan where it all began in many respects, at least in southern Afghanistan. Uh, so that's historically why that province has long been significant. But it's a very small province. Uh, and it's the uh, fourth smallest province in the country. It has currently six districts. It probably has about 250,000 people altogether. Oh, okay. uh, but a large number of the people who live in that area come from Karzai's tribe or his tribal confederation, which is the Durrani. Uh, his tribe, just for your um, background, is called the Popolzai tribe. Um, so that particular area is very rural, uh, it's very agrarian. Um, most people there are simple subsistence farmers. If they make enough, uh, have enough crops, they can sell it in the local bazaars. So what was the goal of the, uh, the, uh, the State Department folks and the military folks for dropping this uh, PRT? Sure. Uh, provincial Reconstruction Team. That sure. sounds like the, the goal is to kind of build it back up again. Huh? Sure. I think the goals of the PRTs have changed as the war has gone on, but when I was there initially, and I think this is still largely true, overwhelmingly we're there to facilitate good governance, reconstruction, and development activities. Okay. So we're partnered with the provincial government, so they have a governor there, uh, they have a provincial council, provincial police chief, and directors like health and agriculture. And how are you received? Uh, very warmly, I think. Uh, I mean, the, the, when I was there, the governor was a close ally of President Karzai. They, they came from the same tribe. So, and he was actually, the governor had been under arrest, under control for, by the Taliban until we released him when we invaded. So he's very much in favor of our presence there, very supportive. Um, but in many ways, he was sort of a quintessential warlord. Well, uh, but I gather in the reading of the book uh, mm -hmm. that... Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it was kind of like uh, y you never trust uh, an Afghan unconditionally, you know. And, and, and then I'm reading about the governor and the police chief and some of the tribal uh, uh, lords, I guess, mm -hmm. warlords. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were kind of taken out their enemies, uh, including the governor, huh? Right. I think so. Uh, the governor was really brought in as a security governor, more, I would say, than a governing governor. He was very much of the strong arm school of, uh, of counterinsurgency, if you will, really sort of intimidate the population in some respects, control them through his militia. Um, but we, 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 were, we were aware of many of these things, some things we learned after the fact, and we tried to influence it where we could, but when the, the governor was the right-hand man of the, of the president of the country, our influence was limited. So I tried, to, at least in my personal efforts, to build up representative assemblies and other power centers to check the governor's sort of unchecked uh, power. In one of the elections, you, you, you were scheming to get the, the women involved because... I was uh, planning, not scheming. <laughs> well, you were scheming, <laughs> uh, saying uh, that, that, that we're going to have a, a health clinic. But really what you were doing was bringing the women into the health clinic but registering them to vote. Huh? Right, exactly. I, I, you know, as you can scheming. imagine... Scheming. Lieutenant. Well, perhaps, yeah. Uh, you can call me Dan, too, by the way. Okay, uh, thank you. No problem. Uh, it pretty much, you know, there's not a lot of medical assistance in these rural areas. So mm -hmm. we, often we do what are called MedCAPs, Medical Civil Affairs Projects. And that's what we did that day, was to provide health screening to mm -hmm. women in the, in the area. And then my thought was, since the women are there and it's a secure area, we'll allow the UN to kind of come in and talk to them about the election. How are women treated? Because I know that uh, Secretary of State uh, Clinton has, mm -hmm. has talked about uh, that part of the world and Afghan specifically uh, because the Taliban in the past were not uh, very respectful of women. Sure. Uh, in Aruzgan, uh, by and large, women disappear from public around age 12 or 13. Is, t t tell me, t tell me sure. more about that. Sure. You know, um, as we all know, a lot of Afghan women wear the burqa, and in the province of Aruzgan, all the adult women wear the blue burqa. In western Afghanistan, they wore more of the black uh, burqa. Um, but pretty much girls have their head covered, they're covered generally, but their face is open until about 12 or 13. And then they start to wear the burqa, and they start to... They're not as... Um, the burqa is just the... Just the, just the sort of a mesh screen, yeah. and then the rest is a light blue uh, cover down to right. their feet. Um, and pretty much uh, marriages there are arranged between families. Um, we do have a girls' school we built, and there's subsequently been a girls' high school that's been built. Um, change is incremental, uh, if, at, if at all. Uh, and uh, women largely, you know, the whole time I've been there, I've probably spoken to five Afghan women. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. I actually had a conversation. Huh. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what transpired in that conversation? 
Uh, one was a very Americanized Afghan woman. Uh, she spoke English. Um, the others were very sort of perfunctory conversations. Our concern is not to uh, be viewed by the population as change, to trying to change the culture faster than it's able to change. And, and we're, we're very sensitive to the perception that we are um, doing things that adversely affect women because the rumor network, you know, people are illiterate in the population. We call it the village network. People yeah. start talking. Yeah. Um, even female soldiers, when they have their uniforms on, to many Afghans look like they're men. So we have to be very careful that any gesture you know, is, is, you know, sort of uh, innocent. And, um, but we still try to do things. We're always just trying to work with communities to build girls' schools. Yeah. We, for example, we try to increase female voter registration, get more women to run. So what do you think you would uh, chalk off as your biggest uh, success when you were stationed there? I think, honestly, just it's not going to be one you probably think of tra traditionally. It's just trying to understand the human terrain, understand the history of the province. Because one of the problems about fighting a war this long is we're relentlessly rotating in units, and we always mm -hmm. have a short-term mentality. And it's difficult to have get to the point where you may have some wisdom about a place beyond just getting situational awareness. And I think I've I created a who's who. I inherited and I expanded a who's who of the province yes. sort of document, and that has continued to be a living document. I I, I like to hope it's still there if I go back. But um, um, what's the biggest uh, impact when you're there and people you know are dying? I think. I mean, if you want to focus on the negative aspects of it, you certainly um, deal with the issues of mortality very early. Uh, and depending on what age you are, that can affect you quite dramatically and, and the kind of violence you experience or you witness. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there are things I have not seen yet that I'm glad I haven't seen. Um, and frankly, I had a very high threshold for what I thought I needed to go through in order to be affected by the experience. But I think um, that sense of mortality and also a sense of being part of something larger than yourself, you know, the Afghan war, um, is bigger than you. It's it's bigger than your units, your country's How are we doing struggle. There? How are we doing there? Uh, I think in many ways we're finally doing uh, the things that we probably should have been doing earlier in the war, but for a variety of reasons we didn't get to that point. Uh, and, and but unfortunately, you know, the American patience is sort of gone now about the war. So it's sort of a running out of time. But we're doing a lot of the things. We're, we're finally doing a lot of the right things. I would say two things that come to my mind to, when you talk about Afghanistan right now. 2014 is a kind of a magic date that the president wants to pull the troops out. And the other thing is uh, you, you read from time to time now about negotiating with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a quick thought on Sure. Uh, I think, the, from what I understand, the Obama administration is still negotiating what kind of role the United States will have, certainly after what it calls the surge troops have largely uh, left next year. So I don't know exactly. I don't know if I doubt it will be zero U.S. troops there. Sure. Uh, I think that's still in flux. Um, I think negotiating with the Taliban, I know that's um, part of our U.S. government's policy, but I think it's very difficult uh, because I think the perception among people in the region is that the Taliban have, uh, there's this saying that, uh, that you often hear the Taliban say, you have the watches, but we have the time. They know that we're looking to pull out now. It's very difficult to communicate victory and pulling out. You can't really compromise both. And I think the Taliban feel as if they're in a stronger position negotiating. Uh, and frankly, I don't think they have any incentive neg to negotiate. They're getting everything yeah. they want without with doing nothing. I um, question that much. It's very hard. Uh, I think we should try, but it's very hard. We just have a minute left. Uh, you're an author. You keep uh, marvelous journals uh, in order to be able to put this together. What a deep book, uh, rich with uh, exposing me to the culture, the war, uh, the people there. Um, one of our one of our uh, uh, underwriters is the National Education Association. They have this kind of read across America thing. Uh, reading and writing very important, isn't it? Right. And, and to you specifically. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I think going living in a predominantly literate province makes you appreciate the freedom that literacy can give you. And I think meeting and working with the few literate Afghans in that province, you really get a feel for how isolated they feel when the whole village is illiterate. Oh, and just yeah, and how yeah. cut off people are from other options in life and other opportunities and mm. absolutely 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 love to read and uh, love to write. Ha, ha, ha. You did a fa fa fabulous job here. Uh, how do you feel about going back? Oh, you know, I was as you may know, I was at the Pentagon on 9/11, and I'm, um, yeah, I feel that uh, you know, for me, I. I I still believe we should win at all costs, and, uh, but I realize we have to deal with reality, the way our economy is, and the budget. But um, 
you know, I'm still very motivated to do what I think we need to do to win. Um, I just know that you know we're moving on to other things in our country, so it's it'll be an interesting transition. I'm very motivated to go. I can't wait to go. I volunteered for this tour as, as I had the others, so um, I'm looking forward to it. We are, uh, I consider it, uh, uh, I can say an honor, but I consider it just very fortunate that we do what we do because it allows me to sit down and talk with you for a half hour. Mm -hmm. uh, just thank you so very much. Thanks. Dan, appreciate it. thank you very Thanks. much. Thank Great. You. Thanks for having me. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. This Is America is made possible by the National Education Association, the nation's largest advocate for children and public education. The American Federation of Teachers, a union of professionals. Kunsan Corporation, forging a higher global standard. The CTC Foundation, AFO Communications, and the Rotondaro Family Trust.